I think the time is up for now. Uh, so uh, let's begin. Good day or good evening, everyone. This is Miki from Wisonic Medical. Uh, welcome to join this global webinar of Wisonic Dandelion College. Uh, here is a platform for sharing and learning more about ultrasound applications to anesthesia, pain management, and uh, intensive care. Today, it is really an honor to invite Dr. Uh, uh, Fadio and uh, Dr. Mamat here. Uh, and uh, now, welcome Mr. Yep from Spectral Scientific, the partner with Sonic Medical in Malaysia. He will give a brief introduction to Dr. Mamat at the first. Good evening and good day to everyone, especially to our speakers. Dr. Sharidan and also Dr. Mafizal Mamat, and also Miki from MySonic and all the doctors all around the world. I'm Yap, I'm the Business Development Manager for Spectra Scientifics in Nuremberg, Malaysia, and we are the distributor for MySonic in Malaysia. I'm honored today to introduce to you our moderator of tonight, which is uh, Dr. Mafizara Mamat. So Dr. Mafizara Mamat currently is the head and consultant anesthesiologist in Glen Eagles Patini Hospital. He provides anesthetic, uh, anesthesia for all the specialties and heads the critical care section of the hospital. Being responsible of the critical care management in the hospital, he is also involved with several hospital management committees in ensuring quality service being delivered. Dr. Mamat got the Masters of Anesthesiology in University of Malaya postgraduate diploma in clinical ultrasound in University of Melbourne, fellowship in regional anesthesia in Royal Perth Hospital, and also studied perioperative medicine in University of Monash. And he got his Master's of Business Administration also in the International Medical University. The special interest of Dr. Mamat is cardiothoracic anesthesia, transthoracic anesthesia, transesophageal echocardiography, ultrasound guided and nerve stimulator regional anesthesia, advanced life support and trauma, and high fidelity simulation. So without further ado, I welcome our moderator for tonight, Dr. Mafizara Mamad. Thank you very much for the introduction. That was kind of you. Good day. Assalamualaikum. Uh, salam sejahtera is how we say it in Malaysia. To those who have tuned in from wherever you are in the world, welcome. A big thank you to uh, Wisonic Medical for inviting us to be here tonight. For, for me, uh, for us, we are in the evening at eh, 9 p.m. And uh, of course, uh, thank you uh, and uh, welcome to everybody. Okay, uh, one cannot, and I will be your moderator today, uh, one cannot deny the fact that uh, recently how ultrasound scientific basic knowledge and technology have played a more important role in providing optimal care in anesthesia and critical care. Hence, the two topics that will be touched by our eminent speaker today, Dr. Sharidan Fadil. In Malaysia, clinical ultrasound was picked up by the non-radiologists, such as the anesthetists and intensivists, first leave for insertion of uh, invasive lines and peripheral nerve blocks back in 2007 to 2008. And as an aesthetist, the usage of ultrasound has become revolutionary in defining the most astute care for our patients. As the usage of clinical ultrasound gained a wider audience for acute care, the take up from the emergency department, as well as the intensive care unit, medical personnel became more prominent in helping to confirm the clinical suspicion of differential diagnosis for a more definitive care. Perioperative ultrasound practice is important, not just for our own perioperative management assessment, sometimes as partners to the surgeons as well, in terms of assisting them when they would need intraoperative ultrasound to be done. Hence, it is with great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sharidan Fadil, who was one of the pioneers in the practice of clinical ultrasound in Malaysia since 2007. I'm very lucky to have him as part of my team in my department in Glen Eagles, Medini, Johor. The two topics that he will present today would be the overview of perioperative ultrasound 
and lung ultrasound for anesthesiologist. Dr. Sharidan is a very prominent speaker and well-known amongst the anesthesia and intensive care fraternity in Malaysia as well as in, in the Southeast Asian region as well as Asia. He was a medical graduate from the University of Malaya, Malaysia and obtained his FRCA. He was then attached to a teaching hospital, National University of Malaysia, before trading his, uh, playing his trade in Singapore and came back to Malaysia in 2017. Dr. Sharidan Fadil was the past convener of the Special Interest Group in Regional Anesthesia, College of Anesthesiologists, Malaysia, from 2009 to 2017. He is currently uh, the, direct, the, the director in the board of directors of the Asia Oceanic Society of Regional Anesthesia, AUSRA. He had also served as the president of the Society of Emergency and Critical Care, Critical Sonography, Malaysia, and currently still sits in the executive community board. He actively publishes in journals with interest in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia, point-of-care ultrasound, and airway. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Sharidan Fadil. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mafizir al Mamad, for the kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank uh, Visonic for inviting us to share uh, with us uh, our passion in perioperative uh, ultrasound. Um, Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening from Malaysia to all the audiences throughout the world. Uh, okay, without further ado, um, I would probably start my presentation now. I'm just gonna press the share screen. Uh, press top. Okay. Okay, uh, can everybody see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, we'll we'll um, start the ball rolling. I've shared this topic at various uh, platforms. Actually, um, this one uh, was at the ANSCA meeting, Australian New Zealand College of Anesthetists meeting, uh, sometime last year in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, this was uh, a near similar presentation in the. Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists meeting uh, that was held June last year. Uh, so the talk will be about the same with some um, adjustments here and there. Uh, in terms of disclosure, I, um, as the, the talk is um, uh, hosted by Visonic, uh, Visonic uh, has uh, um, agreed to pay me a, a small amount of honorarium for the trouble. This is where I work at the moment with uh, Dr. Mafizirang. Uh, it is a 200 odd bed um, tertiary hospital with uh, nearly all the spe specialties and subspecialties available. Uh, and this is what I do on a nearly everyday basis. Just to highlight this point, this is actually a breast tumor uh, where the surgeons uh, removed it. And he has asked my help to actually uh, confirm whether he has actually managed to excise uh, the whole tumor. Uh, of course, this is not something that I do on a regular basis. That I'll I'll uh, share um, uh, more of uh, my assistance with the surgeons in my later slides. Uh, again, as mentioned, uh, I have been the past convener of the special interest group in regional anesthesia uh, under the auspices of the College of Anesthesiologists Academy of Medicine Malaysia. Uh, we, uh, the SIGRA, um, leads the um, fraternity in terms of uh, propagation and training of the, re of the art of, and science of regional anesthesia in the country. Uh, I also mentioned I was the past president of the Society of Critical and Emergency Sonography, which is actually uh, the Wind Focus Malaysian chapter. Wind Focus stands for World Interactive Network Focus on Critical Ultrasound. Uh, which is actually a non-profit body 
um, with the passion and interest to spread the use and science of uh, critical or point of care ultrasound. So in order to start the ball rolling, it's also important that how we look in, in the past and how uh, ultrasound has actually um, been uh, practiced by anesthesiologists. Uh, if you look at uh, the literature, it was in 1978, there was this actual article uh, on the use of Doppler ultrasound uh, in the detection of the uh, subclavian vein. So basically, the Doppler was used to actually locate the subclavian artery and uh, the supraclavicular block was performed uh, with a, a, a kind of a hybrid landmark technique. Uh, it, was un it was only in 1989, uh, this was actually the first documentation of uh, ultrasound assisted um, peripheral nerve block. So this was two authors from Singapore actually. What they did was actually in the uh, upper image was actually um, an auxiliary view prior to a block. So, and then they put down the ultrasound and perform a block uh, as, a, as a landmark technique. And then subsequently afterwards took an image and video of uh, the block after uh, the, the auxiliary um, compartment afterwards. And you could see uh, definitely there's a lot more LA at this particular point. So this was the first documented ultrasound assisted uh, peripheral nerve block. Subsequently, um, Stephen Capral and the Austrian group uh, did an ultrasound, real-time ultrasound guided supraclavicular block. And you can see this is actually pre-block and this was post-block. So even at this point in 1994, there was probably more of imaging, imagining rather than imaging because it's technically you know, very difficult. Again, I'm just going to show you what was before and what was after, so at this point. Now, uh, with more advanced machines, what we can actually, um, what we can actually visualize is a lot more of the microstructures. This was actually a publication by a colleague of uh, Manoj Kamaka. So what he did was looking at, uh, this it was uh, the sky, distal sciatic nerve, uh, at the popliteal area, and if you, with a high, frequency machine and with high resolution, what you can see is not just the nerves, but the structures, the fascia around it. Like for example, you can see the paraneural sheath, uh, the epineurium, uh, the nerve fascicles itself, and the subperineural compartment. So there's a lot more that you can actually see. And this is actually helpful, particularly in uh, doing a very um, targeted block. Uh, and then more recently, we had uh, in 2011, there was a description of using ultrasound in assisting um, uh, in doing spinal and epidural. So this was a publication by uh, Chin Ki Jin and Kamaka. So just uh, skimming through it, uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail because in the interest of time. So uh, what we normally do is actually look uh, with the transverse view, particularly to look at the centrality of the spine and looking at the paramedian sagittal oblique view to look at the levels. Again, this is what you look for in the, trans, uh, in the transverse view. And this is where you, know, you look at the tip and you mark uh, the centrality of the spine. This is in between the spine where you can see in a patient who is uh, probably a bit younger, uh, you can actually see even the posterior complex. Uh, this is where the ligament and flavum and the dura sits. And then uh, there's also been description of using uh, the, uh, particularly using the linear probe to locate the interlaminar space for thoracic epidural. And then approaching it uh, using a uh, paramedian approach. More recently, uh, interfacial plane blocks has been described very well and has become popular. The initial description was for the tap block. Now, this was the tap block, and you know, for those um, who are probably new to ultrasound guided uh, facial plane block, these are the three uh, layers 
of the abdominal wall muscles, the external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis. And this is where you put the local anesthetic to perform the transverse abdominis plane block. And more recently, the quadratus sombrum. So technically trying to put, uh, when you put the needle and local anesthetic at the point uh, between uh, the transversus abdominis and the quadratus lumbarum, uh, hoping to actually uh, make the local anesthetic move a bit more posteriorly and hoping for a great, better spread of the local anesthetic. There's also descriptions of the uh, PEX block. I'm not going to go into great detail, but uh, this has been described um, particularly uh, for breast surgery as well as um, uh, some, degree, uh, some form of thoracic surgery. Uh, more recently, the new kit on the block, uh, this is uh, a director's spinal plane block. Uh, so technically, instead of going epidurally, uh, the idea is actually to deposit local anesthetic uh, on uh, beneath the, the plane of the erector spinal plane block. So between the transverse process and the erector's, and the erector's spinal plane. There have been uh, quite a few this, uh, studies to actually approve its efficacy. This was actually by Philip McCare and uh, his um, Vietnamese team. So this was looking at actually open cardiac surgery and uh, they have actually shown that the morphine consumption is very much less uh, when patients are given erectus spinal plane block. This is technically where you put it. Uh, so basically on between the transverse process and the uh, erectus spinal muscle. Again, and in the catheter continuous technique, this is where you put in the catheter. And uh, of course, if you have a unilateral um, surgery, then you only need to put for one side, but if it's a midline surgery, uh, the block has got to be performed bilaterally. Uh, in Malaysia, we just published this last year uh, as part of our SIGRA recommendations uh, for peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, with regards to ultrasound guided vascular access, this was actually a, the first publication in 1986 by um, Akitomo Yone, uh, a Japanese. So what they did was actually use this T-shaped probe uh, and documented uh, the real-time approach for IJV cannulation. And of course, uh, with um, probably not so recent, ASA has published guidelines on this and plus various other uh, bodies. Um, as far as TEE, this was actually the first publication in Lancet in 1980, probably the, the, because of the poor crop is not coming up, but the use of the electron, electronic uh, endoscope. Uh, and, be, and subsequently, since 1980, uh, TEE has become um, an important modality for monitoring uh, in the cardiothoracic anesthesia realm. Uh, there's also been, uh, apart from um, cardiothoracic surgery, there's also been description of the use of focused uh, intraoperative transthoracic echo uh, to monitor hemodynamics as well as to guide in fluid therapy. Okay, so uh, Initially, it was only in 2011 that there was actually a first documentation of the use of lung ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis of, it was a two, uh, it was a two case series. So to confirm the diagnosis of pneumothorax, this was published in anesthesiology in 2011. So subsequently, uh, there was an editorial in the same uh, issue. So if I could read out the editorial, uh, the paragraph at least, if TEE, vascular access, and regional anesthesia represent established mainstream applications of perioperative ultrasound, uh, chest ultrasound, and other modalities have emerged more recently among anesthesiologists. So, so technically at this point, we are uh, at 2011, we can see that um, now there are emerging uh, modalities of the use of other sounds rather than the traditional TEE, vascular access, and, and regional anesthesia. So in the same year, there was actually a New England Journal publication uh, on point of care application, point of care ultrasonography. So uh, at this point in time, uh, 
if you could define what is point of care ultrasound, uh, point of care is basically image that is obtained immediately. So it's real time. It is not uh, an ultrasound where you, you know, the patients are sent to the radiology suite and, and the ultrasound uh, is performed by the radiologist or radiographer. It is actually performed by the clinician, uh, by the clinician here, and it is real time dynamic images. Uh, another characteristic apart from uh, clinician perform and real time is actually focus because uh, there are only several tick boxes that we like to tick whenever clinicians perform point of care ultrasound. We are not performing ultrasound uh, as a complete examination like how the radiologist or radiographer does. And if you could see this list in 2011, uh, right on top anesthesia. So there's only vascular access, regional anesthesia, intraoperative monitoring of fluid status and cardiac function, uh, mainly referred to, uh, mainly referred, uh, referring to TEE. And th there's a long list of uh, you know, other specialties. We're not going to go into detail because uh, uh, the, the talk is mainly for perioperative and I just probably want to concentrate on uh, anesthesiology, so anesthetists perform uh, point of care ultrasound. Uh, subsequently, it was in 2017, there were quite a few series. This was actually a series uh, by RAPM, Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine in 2017. They started to publish uh, various point of care uh, ultrasound modalities for, uh, what, uh, for what they title as regional anesthesiologists and pain specialists. So what is it all about? So um, with regards to the literature, before uh, 2011 and um, onwards, uh, the use of point of care ultrasound by critical care uh, emergency medicine specialists is quite well established. This was actually a publication by Luca Neri, Enrico Storti, and Leonard Lynchstein, the uh, founding fathers of the Win Focus Group in 2007 in critical care med. And you could see that actually uh, what they propose is that an ABCD approach from airway breathing, circulation, which includes echocardiography, vascular access, uh, following down abdominal sonography, soft tissue, uh, and the disability is cranial ultrasound, which I will touch a bit, uh, looking at the optic sh nerve sheath diameter, and then miscellaneous, for example, uh, preventing uh, missed life-threatening lesions and so on and so forth. So this is an ABCD approach. It has actually been um, used and well-documented in other specialties. It was only uh, anesthesia, um, picking it up probably in the last uh, eight to nine years. Uh, there have been a lot of acronyms. This, this is one uh, called Foresight, Focus, Perioperative Risk Evaluation, Sonography Involving Astro-Abdominal, Hemodynamic and Transthoracic Ultrasound. It's quite a mouthful, uh, but you know, it, this is what you can do with ultrasound as what the authors of this uh, um, approach uh, propose from ICP monitor monitoring with the optic nerve shift diameter, endotracheal tube placement, uh, lung ultrasound, looking at uh, evaluation to, to diagnose pneumothorax effusion and so on, looking at the fast examination, focused abdominal sonography for trauma for evaluating free fluid, vascular access, hemodynamics, which include um, um, IBC examination as well as cardiac evaluation. I'll, I'm gonna elaborate a bit on each of these uh, modalities. Uh, okay, this is actually a Canadian Journal of Anesthesiology, uh, publication 28, um, on the point of care ultrasound examination of the upper airway. And you could see that in the indications, it is listed as cricothyroid identification of the cricothyroid membrane for the pre-anesthetic airway evaluation, uh, uh, ETT placement, as well as evaluation of the trachea and vocal cords. There have been other studies. This is actually uh, from our Malaysian colleagues, uh, Adi Osman and Kok Sam published this review, uh, 2016, uh, role of upper airway ultrasound in uh, airway management. There's been quite a few, a number other uh, of review articles published on the role of uh, airway ultrasound, which I will probably not uh, touch on. So just to kind of give you a teaser, again, my, the whole idea of the talk is, is and it's going to be very difficult to cover everything uh, in detail. But I was hoping that, uh, you know, if you could, after listening to this, you could walk away with, you know, if you're not practicing it, to probably have an interest 
to, a, to adopt a point of care ultrasound. So you could see that in this, this is an actually image, a still image, but this is actually an image, the middle video of a tracheal intubation. And this is an image of an esophageal intubation. So, you know, one may ask, you know, if we have uh, entitled CO2 and, you know, the advent of video laryngoscopy, you know, this may uh, not be necessary. Well, it's true, but in this can also be used as uh, a rescue modality if, you know, uh, your entitled CO2 is giving some problems or if you have issues with actually visualizing the vocal cords when you're intubating. The structures can actually be visualized. Okay, this is actually a real-time uh, uh, needle uh, tracheostomy. Uh, you can see this needle is passing through, and this is in the long uh, axis, and this is the short axis. So with ultrasound, you can actually confirm um, the structures. Uh, I believe probably in a patient who's uh, very lean, that's probably not necessary. For those uh, patients who are a bit probably overweight and obese, this may be quite helpful, particularly if you, know, you can't feel the structures. When you put the ultrasound in the midline, if it's really midline, this is what you're going to see. You are, you'll be seeing actually uh, this uh, hyperacuic line, which is the air mucosal in interface. And you will see this hypoacuic structures, which is actually the cartilages. Here, the one uh, right in the middle on top, usually is the cricoid cartilage and thyroid cartilage. And this is the cricothyroid membrane uh, connecting the two cartilages. Uh, this is uh, this, this is what this happened a, a week or two ago, where we had a difficult um, tracheostomy. Uh, my ENT. This was also a formal tracheostomy by the ENT. But what the surgeon was uh, having difficulty in actually palpating because the patient was actually quite obese. Uh, the structures and I offered to help uh, by actually um, documenting and confirming the, the structures. So this point where the surgeon is actually pointing is actually the cricoid cartilage, and this slope downwards on the curse, what my curse is showing is actually the cricothyroid membrane. Uh, so um, even though the surgeon should have probably been best equipped with the skills, but if they're not, then you know I, I believe as part of uh, the um, a good teamwork, the anesthetist should also be able to assist the surgeon in this particular instance. So there have been uh, quite a few uh, studies looking at um, how air airway ultrasound can be used to predict a difficult airway. Uh, so I'm just going to probably just skim through uh, because it's probably going to be um, quite lengthy if I cover it in great detail. So this is technically if you put the ultrasound and you look for the hyoid bone, if you cannot visualize the hyoid bone, uh, it predicts actually uh, a, low, a, set, a relatively low sensitivity of 70%, but a very specific 97% of uh, uh, comic lay hand of more than two or more. So uh, it's just to show that if uh, there's a lot of pre-tracheal uh, fat, then definitely you will, you will be dealing with um, a possible difficult airway. Uh, again, uh, ultrasound of the tongue. And if it's more, if it's thicker than more than 6.1, is it an independent predictor uh, for difficult uh, intubation? There have been other uh, published um, um, measurements or modality uh, measurements uh, uh, with regards to um, predicting difficult airway. So from uh, using the tongue to base to tongue base to skin. Uh, anterior and soft tissue uh, of the neck, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, with regards to uh, prandial status uh, estimation, of, or I'll say confirmation of, of prandial status with ultrasound, so this was actually a review article by the Toronto group. Um, so we can actually look, use ultrasound uh, by looking at the antrum. So this is actually a small antrum. This is an antrum filled with fluid, and this is an antrum filled with solid. Uh, there have been actually on the actual gastric volume. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but in my practice, if I have a patient who has a dubious history of fasting, I will probably perform this 
and I would decide whether you know I'm happy to to do uh, laryngeal mass airway anesthesia, or I would if I have uh, any concerns with regards to the prandial status, if I see uh, a larger antrum with possible solids in it, I would go for a rapid sequence intubation with uh, an ETT. Uh, with this series that I mentioned, the RAPM series, they, they have also published on lung ultrasound for the regional anesthesiologists and acute pain specialists. And I'm just gonna uh, give you a brief introduction. So this is basically, technically, we are looking at the uh, lower zones and this is what we are interested to look for. Okay, this is actually a fast view, uh, or part of the fast view. We look at the liver and the kidney, and this is the Morrison's pouch. But can you see this? This is actually the sliding sign. This is actually the pleura moving in and out, and this is the diaphragm. So by looking at this, when you're dealing with a respiratory emergency, you, you know that you are not dealing with a diffusion, and you're not dealing with a pneumothorax at that particular point. Uh, there have been a publication, a win focus publication in 2012 by Vapuchali et al. Uh, International Evidence Based Recommendations for Point of Care Lung Ultrasound. Um, I'm just going to show you a flow of how we look, how we confirm, um, we rule in or rule out a pneumothorax. So we look for B lines, lung point, uh, as well as lung pass. I'm just going to show you a video of lung point. So this is the point where at this particular white X, okay, you could see the sliding sign. So sliding sign is actually a normal lung, you can see, and then there is no sliding sign. So this is actually a point where the probe is actually at this white arrow. So at a point where there is a pneumothorax and there's also part of the lung that actually is being ventilated or, you know, whether it's spontaneous or uh, active uh, or an uh, IPPV. So if you find this somewhere a bit more posterior, you are you can confirm that there is actually a, a, a moderate or a big size pneumothorax. So I've actually used this to diagnose um, uh, pneumothorax. And this you can do real time uh, without even waiting for the uh, chest x-ray to be done. Uh, there have been also documentation on the use of um, um, ultrasound to actually guide in terms of abdominal recruitment in this particular Korean uh, study where they were looking at uh, lung ultrasound in infants and how um, the alveolar recruitment maneuver is guided by uh, the findings of lung ultrasound. For example, these are actually B lines um, and these are actually consolidation uh, um, prior to uh, the, the actual uh, alveolar recruitment done. Uh, this is actually a protocol published by Daniel Lynchstein, the father of lung ultrasound. I won't go into detail, but technically with ultrasound, you can diagnose pulmonary edema, you can diagnose pneumonia, pneumothorax, as I showed you earlier on, pulmonary embolism, if uh, technically if there's not much findings, and um, pneumonia, uh, with, and, and sorry, COPD. So this is actually a purist protocol where uh, there's no incorporation with other ultrasound examination, but I think in most uh, point of care or perioperative ultrasound practitioners, we do also, also incorporate other examinations, particularly uh, focus echo in our assessment of the lung. Okay, speaking of focus echo, this was actually the REPM article, focus cardiac ultrasound for the regional anesthesiologists and pain specialists again. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, Forgot this was supposed to come earlier on. Okay, uh, I know there was probably some interest uh, with regards to COVID-19. I've just picked up some of the uh, articles here. Uh, not that I'm going to uh, dwell so much uh, in the uh, management of COVID pneumonia, but just to highlight some of the findings. This is actually uh, the findings uh, by the Italian group uh, looking at uh, the pneumonic changes which occurs with ultrasound. And these are actually B lines, which are consistent with uh, a wet lung. Uh, these are actually subplural uh, consolidation. These are also consolidation. Uh, so there have actually enough. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of evidence nowadays, uh, with um, particularly from Europe, uh, of the use of uh, lung ultrasound. And in some instances, lung ultrasound can replace the CT scan, particularly if patients are very unstable or high settings. 
and where CT scan or you know bringing the patient down to CT scan room may be detrimental to the patient. Okay, uh, with regards coming back to the focus echo, um, there's a 2016 publication uh, in JACE by sorry 2014 publication by Gabriel Via et al, which is actually this is the wind focus group. So what they describe is actually focus echo. So when we talk about echo, uh, that uh, basically there are uh, there's a, a, a tier system. So when we uh, send the patient for uh, a formal echocardio echo echo, uh, echo examination, usually it will be an expert or an uh, echocardiographer who is who is performing it, uh, and then there'll be in somebody let's say an intensivist managing patients who are uh, using uh, echo cardiography so most likely the uh, the echo that is performed is actually an intermediate echo or what we call an echo dynamics but what we are proposing that most acute care uh, physicians including anesthetists should actually uh, have some form of basic echocardiography or we say focus echocardiography so when we say focus cardiography echo cardiography we are not uh, performing uh, we are not diagnosing uh, something which is a bit more complicated uh, it is something that what we want is actually to diagnose at least these four conditions. When you have severe hypovolemia, uh, basically when you have uh, hypercontractile uh, heart chambers with small volume or a massive PE when you have the right side dilated or a uh, effusion with a tamponade physiology in this particular view as well as a severe left ventricle dysfunction. If you can, the focus echo is for us to actually use and diagnose these extremes, where it's somewhere in between, it's probably best to actually refer uh, to a, 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 an echocardiography expert. Uh, there's also been uh, some documentation on the use of focus TE. So this is actually coming from the emergency medicine literature on the use of, instead of you know, using 20 or 30 odd uh, views, you only need to have four views to actually uh, assist you in, in managing um, shock patients. Let's follow the protocol. Uh, one of the first few, um, actually the first description of uh, point of care ultrasound was actually focus assessment with sonography for trauma. Uh, and it's been part now part and parcel of the ATLS, looking at uh, possible bleeding uh, blunt in, in blunt or penetrating abdominal trauma. But now, this is a uh, 2019 RAPM application. Uh, anesthetists can also use FAST, for example, of course, when you have a shock patient, a hypotension in PACU, uh, when the differential diagnosis in the critically ill, as well as unique uh, conditions, for example, nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, or abdominal pain following hip arthroscopy. So there's been a documentation of actually, what happened in hip arthroscopy is that there is actually leakage of the arthroscope of the fluid in the in, in the joint uh, into the abdomen and it causes a bit of nausea and abdominal pain and you can confirm this by actually doing a fast examination so what is fast about so there's actually a four view uh, but uh, later on they have described an extended fast which technically is uh, incorporating lung ultrasound into the four views i'm just going to show you what is normal and what is abnormal so this is normal you can see again the morrison's pouch between the liver and the kidney and this is actually abnormal. Can you see the sliver of hyperechoic uh, uh, area here? So technically in FAST, if you have this uh, sliver of hypoechogenicity, uh, it is actually fluid until proven otherwise. And in the case of trauma, the fluid is blood until proven otherwise. Uh, we, uh, another modality to um, predict um, hypovolemia or to diagnose hypovolemia is actually IVC sonography. I'm not going to go into great detail, but this is technically what we do. Uh, for patients who are spontaneously uh, breathing, um, we expect if they are collapsible with inspiration, uh, they're probably uh, we can safely diagnose hypovolemia. And in an IP patients who are on IPVV, I'm just going to bring that back. Okay, patients who are on IPPV, there's distensibility index. Anything more than 15% uh, um, 
increase in the diameter of the IVC uh, during IPPV it predicts actually um, a hypovolemia. Okay, uh, I mentioned about the uh, in one of the earlier slides about D, which is actually uh, uh, disability. So with actually optic nerve sheath diameter uh, ultrasound, when we when we look for this, uh, this can also be it is actually a surrogate uh, also window to the brain. So what you normally measure is actually three millimeters behind the optic nerve sheath or behind the globe, and you measure this optic nerve sheath diameter. In normal patients, it should not be 5.2. In some studies, say 5.4 millimeters. Uh, so I'm going to show you this particular video. So can you see that? So this is actually the optic nerve sheath. Probably not very straight to the globe. So this is what we want to see. If you have a dilated uh, optic nerve sheath diameter, it's quite consistent with actually a raised ICP. And this has been used in uh, various studies. For example, the uh, one that I showed you earlier to, for example, in liver uh, pediatric patients where you can actually uh, um, diagnose a possible raised ICP. Of course, in a, in a tertiary hospital, um, probably it's probably not so important because you, know, you can easily get a CT scan done. But imagine this is quite helpful in a resource limited environment. Okay, coming to shock protocols. So when you are dealing with a shock patients, a hypotensive patients with, uh, uh, I would say, um, undifferentiated shock, where you, you, you're probably not sure what is going on, you can use actually ultrasound uh, to help you in, in reaching a diagnosis. And also not just diagnosis, but also um, in assisting you in, in the management of the patient. Uh, RUSH is a particular um, protocol that's been described, it stands for rapid ultrasound in shock in the evaluation of critical ill. So basically it's rapid ultrasound in shock. So we first evaluate the pump, which is actually a focus echo looking at uh, contractility and the uh, heart function. We can also look at the tank. So basically looking at any sequestration of fluid, for example, in the abdomen, uh, in the chest, particularly uh, if there's any effusion, or also looking at uh, the lung in the anterior uh, part looking for possible pneumothorax, which can uh, contribute uh, to the shock situation, particularly if you're dealing with uh, tension pneumothorax. And then eventually looking at the pipes. So, for example, uh, this position, uh, supersternal notch, as well as the C and D, what we're looking for is uh, triple A um, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm as well as thoracic aneurysm. And the E and F is actually looking uh, for what we call compression sonography, looking for possible DVT to the diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism. There have been a few uh, examples of uh, shock, uh, sorry, a few proposed uh, protocols from ACES, uh, the one that we were talking about, which was RUSH. Uh, so there are actually a few modalities, uh, and we can see that different protocols would describe, you know, they may include uh, some components of uh, point of care ultrasound, but some may not include. But the most, I would say, uh, one of the most uh, complete would be RUSH from cardiac, IVC, uh, fast, aorta, lung, DVT. There have also been incidental findings for those who are practicing, uh, you know, uh, vascular ultrasound, vascular access, as well as ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. Uh, it's important for us to actually. Um, um, realized or actually uh, picked up uh, abnormal findings. This is actually a case report of a femoral nerve block of where the practitioners actually diagnose uh, um, deep vein thrombosis. This is an example of a video of a deep vein thrombosis. You could see that even the arteries are kind of compressible. You apply enough pressure and of course uh, what the vein uh, the, uh, where the thrombosis sits are not uh, occluded, are not uh, very occludable. So it's important not to do this uh, too much because you might actually dislodge uh, the thrombosis and cause um, uh, um, pulmonary embolism itself. There have been other findings as well. For example, you can actually uh, look for splinter. Uh, of course, this may be probably uh, true for emergency physicians, but uh, in my experience, I've had actually assisted surgeons to actually look for uh, uh, foreign body. And instead of uh, you know, they would 
the surgeons wasting their time with II actually help them, particularly when we're dealing with non-metallic objects. Uh, again, these are abnormal, uh, this is actually an abnormal nerve, a schwannoma, uh, abnormal thyroid. This is important, particularly when we're dealing, I've actually diagnosed this uh, when, you know, uh, when we're doing, uh, for example, a supraclavicular block, interscalene block, you will most likely see something abnormal. It's important when you pick it up, at least, you know, refer appropriately. Uh, and of course, abscess. Uh, I've uh, helped uh, quite a number of surgeons, particularly when we're dealing with cold abscess, when it's not really shiny and red outside, and they have difficulty in locating it. So it's much easier for them to actually, you know, we identify where it is, uh, and then, you know, uh, Excision is um, the incision is going to be very accurate. Okay, where are we? We've talked about the past and then a bit, uh, of course, quite significantly about the present. Where are we going to go in the future? So we have seen uh, from card base. Uh, this is probably a bit more, uh, I would say, compact card base to a laptop base, and now we have uh, you know tablets or phones uh, being uh, attached to probes, and these can actually function uh, as an ultra mobile. Uh, ultrasound system. There have been a recent, a not so recent publication, uh, some 2017 in circulation of this handheld echo machines or handheld um, ultrasound systems. Uh, you know, ultrasound has been made se sexy now, you know, uh, this was actually, this is actually a butterfly promotion uh, image. Uh, there's also been um, ultrasound, for example, Clarius, which is actually wireless and you can attach it to uh, your, your phone, and the phone becomes an ultrasound. The, this article just illustrates to us, you know, because of the excess of ultrasound, there have been a democratization of ultrasound. Everybody uh, can get access to ultrasound. And I think it's a good thing that there are a lot more uh, companies coming uh, into the market. For example, Visonic uh, is coming to the market, and hopefully when there's more competition, uh, it's actually good for the consumers. Uh, so now, the concept of focus is probably now persist, where they say that it's personal ultrasound. Everybody can actually afford to actually own an ultrasound system. And uh, 2018 as well, uh, in JAMA, um, it was proposed that it's maybe time to us, for us, the medical fraternity, to add the fifth pillar of bedside uh, examination from just inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation, which is very traditional, what we were taught in medical school and now to include insonation as well. From, so apart from just auscultation, it's important now for us to insulate as well. Um, sometime last year, New York Times published it. So basically what uh, a group of um, volunteer workers did from, this, from the US, that was actually uh, in a mission, they brought this uh, um, butterfly systems. And what they did was actually diagnose pneumonia. See, these are all uh, patients who are most likely uh, will have TB if they have chronic pneumonia and instead, uh, you know, of having ultrasound, which is uh, nearly impossible in this resource, uh, sorry, having, doing chest x-ray in this resource limited environment, they brought ultrasound and made uh, um, a diagnosis of uh, chronic lung conditions. And again, this was uh, uh, the emergency physician that actually brought the system and documented the use uh, of this uh, phone ultrasounds. Uh, there have also been, uh, for example, this is a study which hasn't been published yet, um, but I actually listened to uh, the presentation by Save the Children, uh, one of the international and, uh, humanitarian NGOs. What uh, they did was actually uh, funded the study uh, to look at whether uh, in the resource-limited humanitarian uh, environment, uh, ultrasound can be actually uh, uh, safely performed to diagnose the, the pediatric pneumonia. I guess with all the evidence that uh, we've talked about and I touched about, I think it's time for us to actually embrace uh, point-of-care ultrasound. And this was actually a 2017 communication article where they were looking at, uh, you know, uh, incorporating focus into uh, the perioperative medicine. Uh, there have also been a paper on, uh, this was a 2016 paper on um, basically training, anesthesiology training, and incorporating all the various modalities of point of care or perioperative ultrasound into uh, residency training uh, in North America. So we now have artificial intelligence. I know we, I grew up at least with Terminator and Matrix, and we know that 
uh, this was actually at that point of time uh, was more like a fantasy. You know, you know it was a sci-fi, scientific fantasy. But actually, Hollywood is usually a step forward. And now we can actually, most of our ultrasound machines can uh, do have uh, AI features. For example, this is actually a concept paper uh, written in 2018. What the authors did was looking at the application, the possible applications of, of deep learning. For example, in this cardiac focus, uh, estimation of cardiac ejection fraction, IVC, a diameter, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also applications and examples uh, for um, of deep learning uh, for the lung ultrasound. Uh, I'm not. I won't go into details. So this, technically, this is a concept paper. So I'm just going to highlight this particular uh, features of the Visonic ultrasound. So if you could look at this. So what the ultrasound is able to do for those untrained eye to actually show the practitioner that this is actually nervous tissue. This is the nerve and, and this is where you should actually guide your needle to. So this is actually artificial intelligence. The machine is able to actually learn and recognize structures and uh, assist uh, the clinicians to actually identify the structures for in this particular interest is actually the brachial plexus. Uh, there are also other systems. For example, this is a v, uh, calculation of the VTI or the volume time integral calculation of the IVC, as well as calculation of the B lines. Uh, there have also been uh, systems, for example, you put the ultrasound and the machine can actually just calculate. This is a calculation of the bladder volume. So how do we train? Uh, there have been, um, you know, the, the conventional training, you know, that we normally do, which is the in the workshops. And then uh, you have this men mentorship uh, where, you know, uh, a trainer uh, trains uh, a trainee uh, over a certain period of time. But if you do not have access to that, there are various other modalities. For example, uh, of course, you have the web-based training. This is actually a decent website, uh, Ultrasound uh, USRE, a Toronto website. And even in this particular website, there's actually focus. There's actually a, sub, uh, a, a subsection of focus. Uh, there have been other... Uh, this is a machine that I've used in Singapore, um, which is a hard work. So instead of having a, a model, and having an ultrasound uh, and then you know working on the model this is actually a mannequin and it's actually what it does is actually uh, detects the probe and uh, generates an image and not just generate it but it really can show the trainee uh, the various uh, anatomy of the heart so again this is actually an image of the heart works uh, more recently there have been uh, for example this is sonosim so it's actually uh, a pro with uh, this particular instrument. What you do is, you know, subscribe, and then with the subscription, uh, the internet um, program or software is able to actually function as if you're owning a, 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 an, an echo simulator. So I think I would end, uh, end my first talk with just this caption. This was actually a 20, 2016 publication, perioperative ultrasound. Even after 2016, I think the future is still now because uh, the uptake is, is probably not as much as I would like to see because I think, for example, uh, emergency medicine and intensive care is probably adopting point of care ultrasound much faster than anesthesiologists. Thank you. I'm going to now shift straight to my second lecture. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sharidan. I think as you are preparing for your second lecture, for the participants, if you do have any inquiries or for our Q&A session later, later, please do post it in through the Q&A uh, button or the chat and we'll read out your question. Okay, Dr. Shah, uh, Dr. Shah you ready? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, lung ultrasound for the anesthesiologist. Um, I won't go into great detail because actually to talk a lung ultrasound and I think in the interest of time, we probably have about 10 odd minutes or so. Uh, it's more on the technique or, or the basic technique on how to perform it. I'm just going to skim through some of the evidence. Okay, again, this is uh, my association. Um, this was the original paper by Lynch's 
1993, the father of lung ultrasound, where he documented um, uh, the use of uh, ultrasound in his ICU, 150 patients, of which uh, he had a handful of patients who had empyema, pleural effusion, apical pleural effusion, uh, with patient with uh, ARDS. So uh, this was one of the earlier documentation of the use of lung ultrasound in the ICU. And then eventually, uh, the article that I showed you earlier, this is a 2012 uh, recommendations uh, by the Wind Focus Group. And again, I showed you this earlier, 2007, uh, Lucaneri and Ricostortis uh, EBCDE approach of point of care ultrasound. Again, this is what I showed you earlier. And in anesthesia, uh, there's no mention of actually lung ultrasound. It's actually in uh, critical care, Medicine, there's actually pulmonary assessment, which is lung ultrasound. So where we are today, uh, this is the original article, uh, 2011, and it's histology on the diagnosis, two cases of uh, pneumothorax uh, perioperatively. And this is where, uh, you know, uh, the mainstream of TE, vascular access, and ultrasound has been challenged with other modalities. Um, one of the first few uh, articles was this, uh, the use of lung ultrasound to look at uh, lung consolidation and air bronchogram. Uh, there have been various studies uh, quite recently, uh, perioperatively. Um, uh, this is uh, lung ultrasound in diagnosing anesthesia-induced atelectasis in children. Uh, the, and also lung ultrasound in atelectasis after general anesthesia. So uh, something that we can use, particularly if we have patients who desaturate um, you know, perioperatively or even do not desaturate but are high risk for atelectasis, we can actually perform lung ultrasound. And, pro and as I mentioned in my earlier talk, use lung recruitment to actually look at uh, the, the success of the lung recruitment. This is actually a review article uh, 2016 in BJ Education. Uh, again, uh, this is a review article, uh, but this is a, 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 a Romanian journal, uh, probably not so. Um, there have been also interoperative lung ultrasound, a clinical dynamic perspective. More recently, uh, this was published, uh, the journal of cardiothoracic and vascular anesthesia, perioperative lung ultrasound for cardiothoracic anesthesiologists. Uh, lung recruitment in children. Uh, just to show, to show, you know, from this is where the wet lung to a probably slightly uh, uh, reduced number of B-lines. I'll show you uh, earlier, uh, sorry, in, in my later slides. Uh, again, every recruitment, I think I, yes, I showed this in my first lecture. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, there was also a review article in RPM. Uh, and this is... Uh, uh, they evaluated the use of lung ultrasound against chest X-ray in diagnosing uh, post-operative pulmonary complications after cardiothoracic surgery, and they found that the lung ultrasound was a lot better in diagnosing uh, post-op compli post complications. Uh, again, in pediatric uh, cardiac surgery. So, in terms of evidence, there's actually uh, uh, very good and uh, evidence out there to actually use lung ultrasound in the perioperative period. But how do we do it? Okay. So we can use all probes, but technically the most co the co more common one is the curvilinear probe or the linear probe. And it has to be um, uh, the indicator, usually cephalate or by, you know, um, as, as um, a standard, when you look at the transverse view, uh, the indicator is usually on the right side of the patient. Uh, but all probes have actually been used uh, and has actually been used in, in, in all, in, in most studies. Uh, so, you can use all the probes, uh, but you must understand the limitation. For example, if you use a linear probe that you know that you're not gonna go anything, the image that you see will not go deeper than five centimeters. Okay, this is how you see, because uh, I would recommend that you, uh, as you do a longitudinal scan first for screening, and if you have anything abnormal, then only move to a transversal scan. Uh, this is the device, uh, the, the uh, division of the uh, to topography, for example, if you want to document, then you say R1, uh, sorry, FL1, the left side one. So this is the anterior axillary line, and this is the posterior axillary line. 
and of course we have the five six but you must also remember that you have a scapula here so usually the scan will be paraspinal okay so uh, let's scan okay this is a normal lung let's see what a normal lung looks like on the ultrasound scan okay can you see this is actually a shadow of the rib and this is actually the sliding side. So can you see this movement? So this is actually the movement of the parietal or the vis parietal pleura on top of the visceral pleura. And what you see down here below is actually the reverberations or artifacts, what we call the A-line. This is the A-line. So these are the reverberations. I won't go into the great detail of how it is generated. Okay. If we move from the right lateral chest, if we screen this again to recap. You have the liver, you have the kidney. And this is the sliding sign, or some will call the curtain sign at this point. So if you have an effusion, if you're looking down uh, at the dependent area, you will not see this. Because when you see this, you know that you are not dealing with any fluid collection at, this, at the uh, dependent area of the, of the chest. If you go on the left side, instead of the liver, you will see the spleen, kidney. This is splenorenal recess and diaphragm. And this is what you're going to see. Because this is important to realize because, for example, if you have consolidation of the lung, uh, you need to differentiate that consolidation is not actually uh, a solid organ of the abdomen. Let's see what about abnormal lung. So in terms of pathology, we use lung ultrasound to diagnose uh, four main um, pathologies, perfusion, palmedema, pneumonia, and pneumothorax. Effusion is going to be dependent. So again, as I showed you before, you, this is an echogenicity and it's consistent with fluid. So you will not see, when there's fusion, you will not see the uh, sliding sign. And in some instances, what you see, this is the actual lung where it has been compressed. So this is an atelectatic lung uh, appearing in the effusion itself. Uh, there's actually um, a syndrome called interstitial syndrome. So this is actually a radiological syndrome where if you have uh, increased interloba septal thickening uh, with increased lung water, for example, it can be a palm edema or it can be an early onset pneumonia or even a, a lung contusion. So what you will see eventually is this. This is the A lines that we talk about. You have to play this. Okay, and this is B lines. It's moving. So the more the B lines, so the more florid the B lines, and the thicker the B lines corresponds to a, a, a worse interstitial syndrome. Okay, I won't go into detail on the how it's generated because it's actually reverberation. So the pattern of thickened interloba septa or, or ground glass appearance on imaging study. So the differential diagnosis when you have B lines and diagnosis is ever interstitial syndrome is actually palm edema, pneumonia, contusion, or ARDS. So again, this is a mnemonic picture. With treatment, what happens is that you have improvement of the pneumonia. Okay. So this is a palm edema, edema picture. So you have on the upper parts or the non-dependent area, you have more B lines. For the dependent area, you will see a bit more effusion. This is consistent with palm edema. A pneumonia, uh, this to show some examples, when uh, most of the other, um, for example, when you uh, A lines or B lines, these are actually artifacts, but this is actually not artifact because of the fact that the alveoli is flooded with uh, exotic, uh, it becomes a bit more solid. And what you will see actually on the, uh, uh, on the ultrasound image is actually the consolidation or the, uh, the, the alveoli becoming a bit more solid. So you will see this mnemonic picture. I'm not going to go into great detail. Okay. And in the worst case scenario, you will see hepatization uh, of the lung. So the lung actually behaving or looking more like the liver. Okay. Uh, there, these are some characteristics. For example, you can see the, uh, uh, the, the air bronchogram. For example, the air bronchogram we see on, on chest radiograph. This is what actually we see on ultrasound because we have ventilation you can see that the, uh, the bronchus is actually uh, being separated and it appears on the uh, ultrasound. 
uh, we can actually differentiate between true consolidation as well as atelectasis, where atelectasis, uh, you will see there's no airborne program because of the fact that everything is collapsed. And in consolidation, there may be some areas where there are still airborne program present. With ultrasound, you can easily diagnose uh, effusion. Of course, you know, in this particular uh, uh, consolidation, there's no point of putting a chest drain, where in this particular case, a chest strain would definitely improve the patient's outcome. Again, uh, the, the flow, or I'll say the algorithm for um, lung, uh, for, pneumo, for pneumothorax, I'm not gonna go into great detail, just to revisit this again. So this is lung point. If you scan from the top, you will see no sliding, but when you reach down here below in the whitening, you, what, this is what you will see. Part of the, uh, part of the um, pleura is moving, for example, this one, and part of the, some part of the pleura is actually static, absent of sliding sign. Lung pulse uh, is also one uh, features. For example, you, if there is actually pneumothorax, you won't see a lung pulse because pneumothorax means there's actually air between the visceral pleura and pulse pleura and the pulsation is not going to be transmitted to the chest wall. Uh, so again, this is, the profile that uh, Lynchestein proposed, you know, A profile, if you have a definitely a clear dry lung, a B profile, if it's a wet lung, and an AB profile, if there's a mixture between the A and B profile. Again, visit, revisiting this blue protocol, uh, we can diagnose palmedema, pneumonia, pneumothorax, uh, palm embolism, um, as well as uh, COPD uh, with the blue protocol. Again, okay, this is just a repeat slides from uh, my previous presentation. Thank you very much. This is actually Daniel Lynchstein. Uh, this is a workshop I, we had uh, a few years back in Hong Kong. And this is uh, Bob Pacelli, the main author for uh, uh, the international recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shah. Uh, there was a very comprehensive and uh, I think uh, I could not, like, not, uh, uh, what do I say, to be fully concentrated for the past hour of the two presentations. All right, uh, I think the agenda now, I will proceed to the Q&A session. There have been a few questions that have been asked. Uh, Dr. Shah, you okay, eh? or you need yep. to have a sip of water okay. to... <laughs> Settle okay. yourself. Okay, so I'll start with the first uh, question from the audience. Uh, do you use ultrasound to perform line placement in plane or out of plane? Why? Thank you. Uh, I use uh, both. So of course, I, I you know, uh, use uh, ultrasound for line placement, central lines, peripheral lines in different cases. And even now, most of my arterial line cannulation will be under ultrasound guidance. In most situations, it will be out of plane, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, when we talk about uh, most of my patients, uh, the, the linear probe that we have is a, a larger footprint. So if we use an in-plane procedure, it's probably gonna be quite difficult to cannulate because of the fact that our Asian necks are probably a bit shorter than Caucasian necks. But we tend, I also tend to move around a bit so we can actually move from uh, you know, uh, doing in-plane, out-plane in the same setting, so that we can, uh, particularly when we are having difficulty in to locate. So, so with out-of-plane, it's also uh, the issue is difficulty to locate or to confirm the tip of the needle, which uh, then if you have that problem, you can actually turn and try to use an in-plane technique. So both have got its pros and cons. There have been, there have been a few articles showing that you can actually uh, use both techniques to assist you uh, in the same setting, actually. Thank you. Shall I answer the next one? Okay, the next question is, uh, I have a, uh, oh, not me, <laughs> it's uh, the question from the audience. Uh, I have a very strong potential need to buy an ultrasound. Do you have any recommendation for how many probes I should buy? What type are those probes? And perhaps I think an addition for myself uh, and uh, is a, uh, the kind of ultrasound uh, that you would recommend in the need of, of the place where they are? 
uh, I think um, I think with regards to what how many probes it depends on what are you going to do. Um, if you are trained uh, with most of the point of care or peri point of care perioperative use, then probably it's good to have a linear, a curvilinear, as well as an echo probe, a face array probe. Uh, but if you are not trained uh, to do echo or or you may not want to do echo, then probably two is enough. But I guess for completeness sake, uh, to have three basic probes, which is the linear, curvilinear, and echo probe would be uh, the best option. Uh, then, of course, if you're not trained, you, you, know, you can get yourself trained eventually uh, because there are some limitations. Uh, for example, you can actually do an echo uh, using the sub uh, using the sub in the sub approach using the curvilinear, but if you want to use you know, the parasternal uh, views and things like that, it may be actually quite difficult using uh, the curvilinear. So the echo probe is quite necessary if you want to do echo on a regular basis. That's it now. All right, the next question. Uh, hello, Dr. Fadil. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. What's the difference between point of care ultrasound and perioperative ultrasound? Because I hear many doctors say both of them very often. Oh, I think um, uh, if I, in my earlier slides, I mentioned the definition of point of care ultrasound, which means that it's clinician performed, uh, it's uh, bedside. So bedside meaning it can be anywhere bedside, technically, whether in the ER, in the OT, in the ICU, even in, for example, in uh, uh, the uh, pre-hospital uh, uh, services, it can also be in the roadside. So, and the other, uh, the other characteristic will be focus. So I would say perioperative ultrasound is actually a subset of point of care ultrasound. So point of care ultrasound, all specialties will have some degree of point of care ultrasound. Even the rheumatologists perform, uh, you know, their own uh, ultrasound to look at uh, the joints and so on and so forth. So that's actually technically point of care ultrasound. So uh, to answer your question, perioperative ultrasound is a subset of point of care ultrasound, which is actually a bigger, uh, a bigger group. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to. Uh... Jumble, uh, not jumble, sorry, and in this question together because it is uh, related. Uh, airway assessment. I think one question from the uh, uh, listener. Uh, do you need to measure any structure? And a similar question by a doctor from uh, Indonesia asking about airway sonography. Can you explain in detail how can we confirm the placement of the endotracheal yeah. tube by transverse or longitudinal plane? What landmark can be used? Can the vocal cord be visualized? Are we using convex or linear probe? Okay, um, so the first question, uh, do you measure? You can measure, but I don't normally do it on a regular basis. Uh, there's a lot of evidence. Um, I would say there, there are studies to show that, uh, you know, you measure, for example, the pretracheal fascia or difficulty in, use, in, in, in um, uh, visualizing the hyoid bone. Uh, and other uh, measurements and ratios, you can actually predict um, difficult intubation or difficult airway. That's one thing, but I don't measure on my day-to-day -day work. Um, I only use it when I need to, which is mainly using if, uh, you know, assist, trying to locate for, for example, a possible difficult airway or possible surgical airway that we're planning to do uh, we, or planning as an emergency uh, rescue if the need arises. Um, okay. This confirmation of, yes, you can actually use, you need to use uh, a linear probe. Uh, uh, most of the studies showed that uh, you need to do a transverse view and you look at the uh, basically uh, trachea. And when you look at the trachea, uh, you look for the, actually the movement of the trachea. Uh, if it's actually an endotracheal intubation, if it's actually an esophageal intubation, what happens is that the, uh, um, the the movement will not be uh, the the movement will actually be the esophagus uh, being dilated by the ETT. So you can see that difference. Um, yes, you can use you can usually visualize the vocal cord. Of course, they say the the, the vocal you know you can use the vocal cord for example looking at uh, ventilation. But I you know this is um, possible, but I don't use it and I don't see the need to use it on a regular basis. Thank you.
All right. Uh, I think there's a question regarding the lung ultrasound. I'll combine this question with uh, this one in the Q&A and in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, doctor. How do you calculate or figure out how many B lines at one intercostal window? And the second question would be uh, suggestions in terms of lung scanning. Which protocol is your favorite one and why? Um, the, um, most, I think if you look at the recommendations, so, uh, the 2012 uh, international recommendation, uh, it has to be three or more B lines in the intercostal window. So basically in between two ribs to, for it to be significant. Um, um, because sometimes uh, in the elderly particularly, and if you know, you're a smoker and things like that, there's a lot more B lines which may not be very significant at that particular point. So it has to be three in one intercostal window, one, meaning that in between the two ribs that you see, it has to be three or more for it to be significant. Um, uh, uh, what's the other question, Hafiz? The question uh, is, uh, we're talking about the second, it'd be the uh, protocol of your protocol, favorite okay, yeah. scanning lab. Uh, yeah. uh, as I mentioned, probably in my talk, uh, the, the blue protocol, the bedside lung ultrasound examination by Lynchstein is, is, is um, quite comprehensive, but it's, it's a very purist protocol. It, it looks only at lung ultrasound to diagnose pneumonia, um, palmedema, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, but I think um, as a whole, um, I would also combine it with, you know, uh, using a bit of echo DVT scan if you're concerned about pulmonary embolism and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I, yeah, currently I, I kind of examine uh, the areas that I'm concerned with and I look for the possible diagnosis, which is a pneumonia, effusion, uh, edema, uh, as well as pneumothorax. Uh, I don't really strictly follow uh, the blue protocol, but I also combine it with, as I mentioned, uh, other, uh, examin other uh, ultrasound examination. So, but it's important that you know how, how to diagnose these four conditions for you to be able to use it. Of course, there are other ways of using it. For example, looking at uh, whenever you, you're you know, in, in the critical care setting, you can use ultrasound to actually look at improvement of uh, uh, of the of the lung condition with uh, alveolar recruitment, or even looking at the lung, for example, improvement uh, of your uh, palm edema, whether your management is doing any good with uh, even diuretics or non-invasive ventilation and so forth and so on. So you can actually use it not just to diagnose, but to guide your therapy as well. Um, so, um, yeah, that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Dr. Shah, I think since we are in the lung ultrasound, uh, are we able to assess the severity of pneumonia or stages of it? I mean, uh, within, with the ultrasound? Yes, you can. Uh, I didn't go into great detail. Actually, um, you... Uh, once uh, there's actually a uh, consolidation setting and the first that will appear is actually B lines, uh, which is interstitial room. Then, of course, if you have more uh, alveolar uh, consolidation, what happens is that you will see more C profile. You will see more uh, echogenicity coming from beneath, from the pleural line. And in the extreme, it's actually uh, the hepatization where you look at, I see the, the lung is all flooded and in, in actual pathology, if you, you know, excise the lung, it's going to look similar to a liver. So uh, you can look at the severity because then, of course, if you map the areas, uh, how bad the lung is. So most of the time uh, in real situation, when we deal with ICU, you don't get the whole lung being pneumo uh, pneumonia. Usually, palm edema, yes, you will get a generalized palm edema. With improvement, you will see that it will move, the palm edema will move to the dependent area. But uh, in pneumonia, you will probably see uh, uh, a very uh, specific area that's pneumonia. But in ARDS, it's different. ARDS, you can see, you know, parts of it having pneumonia. There's also going to be effusion. There's going to be uh, a consolidation and so on and so forth. And it varies. And of course, you will see uh, more of it in the dependent area uh, in the ARDS. So you can actually look at severity and also you can actually look at, uh, um, I would say, you, you use it to guide your therapy. I mean, I've had, uh, I did, a stint um, in Italy once where I uh, we even use it to actually look at 
the lung, this patient had severe uh, coming quite pneumonia and was put at ECMO. And the patient was, uh, the lung was actually monitored to, um, to see when was the right time for actually to the ventilation to start back. Uh, so basically the lung was rested. And when there's actually improvement on lung ultrasound, uh, the, the ventilations, uh, the, the conventional ventilations uh, is started back for the patient. Thank you. Okay, next question maybe uh, regarding the current pandemic of COVID-19 that we have uh, worldwide. Uh, how about your experience, anything while fighting against COVID-19? And uh, you reckon that the performing ultrasound will be safe when scanning COVID patients? And what would your preference precautionary measures in your setting? Uh, okay, if, with regards to my experience, uh, I have to be honest, I don't have much experience. Most of the patients that we deal with uh, have been negative, uh, you know, the pneumonia patients. I think uh, Dr. Mafis will probably have more experience and this will be part of his talk later on. But um, uh, in Malaysia, uh, at least um, there have been, uh, particularly from uh, the emergency medicine fraternity, they've actually incorporated lung ultrasound in in the screening of uh, possible COVID patients. So uh, because in order to, to for each and everybody of this to, to suspected COVID to get CT scan may not be feasible. So they've actually incorporated and they've um, actually uh, shown that uh, the yield is quite uh, significant. If you have COVID uh, pneumonia, uh, and even though it's a fairly asymptomatic, the um, the findings will be quite uh, will be positive when you do lung ultrasound, uh, which is um, easy. You know, um, um, it doesn't require a patient to move around, particularly when they are COVID and then moving around. So there have also been protocols um, on how to actually do it safely. For example, of course, the patient is PP, but also the equipment can be actually uh, protected. There have also been uh, documentation literature of using cordless ultrasounds. For example, so the the the, the probe, which is cordless and separated from the actual screen, is actually being covered, and then you scan, and then uh, you know at least this minimizes uh, the potential of spread through the actual cord and the machine itself. Uh, I hope that answers the question. But uh, with this regard, probably uh, we could advertise that you're doing a talk sometime earlier at the end of the month. <laughs> I just maybe add a bit regarding the uh, for COVID nineteen patients. Uh, I had the privilege to be in the uh, our Malaysian main COVID hospital during the uh, peak of the pandemic in our country, and uh, definitely ultrasound has been a very useful tool because uh, partly in terms of the one thing that of course we have our own we take precaution in terms of our PPE and protect. Uh, ourselves, but it becomes the, I think what Dr. Shah mentioned in his talk, the fifth element of your clinical examination. Because, for example, when you auscultate, it's very impossible to sort of like uh, have your, your stethoscope and listen without exposing yourself to the patient directly. And ultrasound plays a role in that sense to get that extra sense and assessing real time what, for example, uh, how when you are auscultating the lung and, but you, and uh, looking at the ultrasound, as well as the clinical conditions, as I think most of you are aware, for COVID-19 patients to be hypercoagulopathic and uh, having uh, conditions of sudden pulmonary embolism. And the assessment of focus, your point of care ultrasound would help you in terms of appropriate, uh, putting a more direct management to the most likely possible a diagnosis rather than because you can't really send patient unstable uh, or just blind treatment so you would be more focused on that all right i think uh, another can uh, uh, another question i think uh, okay about the ultrasound when dealing issues intraoperatively like uh, abdominal surgery oh okay um uh if you're dealing um uh, if the, the surgery is ongoing uh, there's probably and if you have, for example, an unstable patient, uh, uh, it's it's uh, quite it's it's possible, but it's quite difficult. For example, if you want to do a lung scan, you can actually you know uh, you know go under the drapes and try to do lung scan. Echo is is possible to do some views, but not all views. The ideal situation, the ideal answer to that would actually if you have an unstable patient, 
uh, who's undergoing laparotomy and you want to use ultrasound to guide your hemodynamic uh, management is actually a TE. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the non-cardiac surgery, you don't need to re- be an expert in TE. There are only about uh, four views that's uh, from uh, the uh, emergency medicine literature that you need to master to you know, diagnose uh, the, 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 the common um, uh, diagnosis. For example, you're talking about uh, tamponade, or left ventricular dysfunction or hypovolemia. Um, these are the, uh, um, the main diagnoses that you can actually use uh, a transesophageal echo to, to actually assist. So if you don't have that, like for example, um, I'm, I, I don't do much transesophageal echo. So usually I try my best to, to you know, in underneath the drips uh, and then uh, use other modalities, for example, central line and things like that uh, to actually uh, 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 get some form of um, um, uh, information where the patient is at now. Uh, and then once the laparotomy finishes, then uh, you know, I will probably do a more complete examination. So it's also worthwhile to know if I had uh, a patient who's unstable preoperatively, I would scan them beforehand and, and you know, either before induction or post induction, depending on the situation, but I would scan them beforehand, uh, pro- provided that the case, I mean, the surgeon uh, allows me to do so because in, in this example, some, for example, AAA A uh, coming to you, rupture AAA, you, you don't have that luxury. So it depends. Um, so if you have a high-risk case, I would also, uh, for example, high-risk case emergency in the middle of the night, I would do an echo myself and have an idea on what the function is like. Uh, if the volume of the patient and other, and, and kind of a sc- uh, screen uh, the patient for other uh, possible, for example, if the patient has got some uh, intestinal obstruction or possible perf, whether there's any fast, uh, doing a fast, whether there's any fluid accumulation, which could you know point to um, uh, possible abdominal sepsis and so on and so forth. So you can actually do it uh, pre-op, of course, post-op. Intra-op can be a bit tricky. Uh, that's that's my experience. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, we have like a few, just a few minutes. Maybe just one quick comment on this last question: role of intraoperative ultrasound for hepatobiliary surgery. Oh, okay. Um, you can, I, I think for mainly for hepatobiliary surgery, it's, uh, I, I, uh, the surgeon sometimes, uh, I have in the past, uh, the surgeon have asked me to you know, have a look at the uh, gallbladder. I, I guess uh, more so to, you know, to diagnose whether there's any, um, the condition, whether it's inflamed, uh, whether there's any, a lot of uh, peri, um, peristic fluid and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, if there's any concerns about um, shock secondary, uh, septic shock secondary to you know acute cholangitis and things like that, it should be uh, uh, a shock protocol ultrasound should be performed. So at least you know what you're dealing with. And, you know, at least you know, for example, the heart is good. What you're dealing with is most likely the volume, or if the volume is good, and the rest is uh, and the still there is a certain degree of uh, hypertension. So you might be dealing with septic shock. Uh, based on also the findings of your the gallbladder uh, or the focus uh, gallbladder examination as well. So I think you need to, uh, I think the answer to that will be more of uh, assessment uh, using it as part of the shock protocol to actually assist you in the management, the period management of, of these patients. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. I think uh, for your perseverance to answer uh, questions, definitely the interest from our viewers today. Uh, thank you very much again to everybody to log in and uh, to listen for the whole session today. Uh, from the Wisonic side, any closing that you are uh, want to say before we end this session? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it is really an impressive, impressive sharing. I saw the audience I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks to Dr. Fadio and Dr. Mamda today. And uh, especially thanks to all the audience who stay with us all the time. Uh, for more information about the Wisonic new webinars, please follow uh, Wisonic public account on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, thank you all and see you next time. Goodbye, thank Dr. Fadio and Dr. Mamda. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Miki. Good night. Bye bye.